Quick behind the scenes note, if you're wondering how we actually prepare for this, the absolute most important document you can find is the operator's manual. Uh, these days, the TM technical manual, sometimes also known as a dash 10, because a dash 10 means operator's level as opposed to dash 20, which would be the next level of maintenance. With it, you got all the instructions on how we do everything. So you may not even need to watch the video if you got one of these. We're gonna start our tour of the fighting compartment, such as it is with the driver's position. Mounting the vehicle, simplicity itself. My old tanker knees appreciate this. Come forward to step over the driver's seat. You can see that the steering wheel has been cut away underneath, so I have a good bit of room for my knees. And then I am. It's not the most comfortable position in the world, but I guess I can drive it. Now I'm actually sitting on a stowage box. The entire seat will lift up and back. The seat itself is adjustable forwards and backwards, and the backrest will go up or down. There are two pedals, the brake and the foot throttle, which most of us will call the accelerator. To the right of that is a little foot pedal for a hull drain uh, towards the front. Last thing I have on the right here is the primer. There is also a very large warning sign. There's warning. Brake must be firmly applied and locked before firing the gun. We're gonna come back to this. All right, so the dash is pretty much what you would expect to find on the vehicle of the era. On the left-hand side are the controls for the engine itself, the magnetos, the starter motor, transmission oil temperature high, um, engine oil, engine pressure, RPMs, and the dial at the bottom shows how many hours the engine has run. In this case, it's showing 1,505.9. Moving to the right, you have the ammeter, shows how much uh, the generator's working, there's this toggle for blackout drive or uh, infrared drive. High beam, low beam is a simple toggle on the far right. The speedometer, low and right. And on the right, you're gonna find the controls for the headlights. And in a case of, if it works, don't change it. The headlight switch design basically stays the same on US Army vehicles for the next 40 or 50 years. If you're driving a Humvee in the 1990s, you will be familiar with how this headlight switch works. Uh, very recently, they started changing to a push button system. Ford steering wheel, of course, doesn't have a huge range of motion. That's as far as it needs to go. Transmission is located on the control stock. So we've got neutral, low range, high range, or come all the way down for reverse. And there is a very simple indicator, which you see through the steering wheel. To start the vehicle, uh, you have master power is located at the front left, so turn that on. Of course, make sure that your lights and your radios are off. Make sure your magnetos are off and then hit the starter. What you're doing here is very briefly check for hydrostatic lock to make sure that the engine will actually turn. If this works, what you do is you turn the magneto to A or B or both. You prime it a couple of times if necessary. And then you hit start and boost. And you will come to life and you use your hand throttle or foot throttle to hold it idle at about 1,200 RPM for the next five minutes and you will be ready to go. Once you get going, the vehicle will do 28 miles an hour in high range, 12.3 in low range or in reverse. The vehicle won't neutral steer. It will, however, pivot steer. Lock one track, the other will describe a nine foot radius circle. You are doing all this through a clear windshield in the gun shield. The gun shield itself is the only thing that could be even remotely considered armor on this vehicle. It's about four or five millimeters thick. So it will at least stop the bugs going into your face at 28 miles an hour. So you've been driving around, you've had your fun, you wanna turn off the engine. Well, first thing you wanna do, of course, once you're in neutral and parked, is you wanna hit the fuel cutoff, which is this button here. Just push down, eventually it'll cut the flow of fuel to the engine, engine will die. Turn off your magnetos, turn off your master power, and you are done. By the way, the little button up here to the top right of the master power, that's the horn. You gotta have your horn. 
So the gunner gets what is probably the most worrying position in the house. Now, initially, you don't think it's so bad. I actually have a fair bit of room. The seat is on springs. It's nice and comfy. The problem is to his left. Now, when the M56 or the T101 was originally being developed, the idea was you were going to put the T119 90mm gun onto it. This became the M36, as found on the M47 medium tank. However, it was soon determined that you couldn't actually get one of those things onto a T101. So they started development of an entirely new 90mm cannon, the T125. And it was specifically for use on this vehicle. The T125 became the M54 mounted on mount M88 on this vehicle. The M54 could fire the entire range of 90mm ammunition. So it was backwards compatible with the earlier M1, M2, M3 and M26 slash T8 90mm guns and also the M36 of the later type. Now M36 and M54 ammunition could not be fired through the earlier 90mm guns. Their typical ammunition would be the M318 armor piercing round. And this was a 44 pound round, which would punch through about 190 millimeters of armor at a kilometer. Now the price for this was the gunner's face. The problem was this is such a light vehicle. As the gunner has his head to the side and he pushes the electrical trigger on the traverse handle, the entire vehicle is going to rock back, and a video of it is very impressive. Indeed, it is probably safer for him to pull his head away from the side and then pull the trigger while holding on for dear life. Firing this gun would have been, we'll call it an adrenaline rush. I'm going to meet, read something from an official army publication, PS Monthly. It's a sort of a, a comic book user's helpful hint guide, not the actual manual. But it says the following. It is possible to fire this gun straight forward, or at least nearly straight forward, with all the crew in place on the vehicle. Therefore, you can operate in a ready-to-fire condition when in immediate contact with the enemy and can take advantage of sudden contacts. However, the recoil is going to be most unpleasant. And if the gun is traversed out towards the limits of its travel, particularly to the right, it's going to cramp the commander and may injure him when fired. For anything but sudden around the corner shots, the loader and commander should dismount. I have never seen any other user manual that says, this vehicle kicks so badly, you're better off not on it but that's exactly what you got with the M56. It's actually kind of cool. Anyway, moving on. So to get going with the gun, you're gonna to want to first clear the gun for action. What you wanna do is remove the canvas shrouds, which are covering the ammunition, the breech, the optics, and the counterweight. Now, I should point out, early T101s had a T-shaped blast deflector. The production models had a simpler counterweight with a hole drilled on each side, such as on this vehicle. There is a manual safety on the top of the gun. It's a simple lever. Uh, with that done, uh, the next thing you want to do is you want to prime the recoil cylinders. And this is a hand pump. You pump this backwards and forwards. There's an indicator on the back, which will protrude a certain amount, depending on how much pressure you have in it. When you are now loaded and ready to fire, you remove the mechanical safety. There is an electrical safety switch here. The gunner then aims by use of the elevation handwheel and traverse handwheel. He's got 30 degrees of traverse per side, 15 degrees of elevation, and a good solid 10 degrees of depression, which will probably do interesting things to your recoil effect. When you hit fire, yeah, hold on for dear life. Recoil will occur. Breach will open up, loader will set about his duties. To aim, the gunner will be equipped with a T126 telescope direct vision. It's selectable power by four or by eight. It's graduated with either HVAP T137 to 3,200 meters or 4,800 meters for everything else. It is mounted on an adjustable mount here, so there is for bore sighting, 
you release the locking lever, you alter the mount position, place the locking back in. There is also on the site itself a spirit level that you can adjust for cant and uh, that'll help you more accurately hit your target if your vehicle is not on level ground. Lastly to the gunner's front, two items to note. First is the air cleaner. It actually has a little selector for summer or winter setting. And the fuel filler port. The fuel tank is 55 US gallons, which will get the vehicle about 140 miles. Now we move to the back. So as you can see, the loader seat is actually nowhere near where his duty position is. When the gun is being prepared to fire, he's got to get up, walk around the gunner, come down, and then he's got to open up his platform, which at least is simple enough. It just hinges back and falls down. This now gives him a little bit of working space that it can access the three racks of ammunition, 29 rounds in total. Due to the commonality between all the different guns, you can put basically anything in here from smoke white phosphorus to blank ammo. So demonstrating how this fits with a wooden round, you see that's about as far as it goes before you start to hit a spring load. It takes a lot of pressure to come in before you would close down the latch. I'm not going to do that right now. You can see how quickly the round will come out and hit you if you weren't, if you weren't ready for it. To demonstrate if the tube has a round in it or not, there is a little pressure sensor here all it does is just passes through the front. The base of the round will push this up. If the little nipple here is sticking out, you know that there is actually a round in that tube. If the round is flush like it is right now, you know not to bother opening up the round. Loading process, simple enough. Semi-automatic, so you've got to open the breech the first time. Pull down on the plunger, what we know is a breech operating handle today. Breech block drops. Return the plunger back up to the stowed position. Throw your round in, sit back, and hold on. In the event that the round fails to fire, well, firstly, the gunner has a manual trigger, so he'll pull sharply down on that and see if it does anything then. If you have to recock, there is a manual recocking lever. Simply pull back on that, stay clear, and let the gunner shoot again. If that still doesn't work, if you got a dud round, pull it out, put another round in, and continue on. Outside of feeding the gun and holding on for dear life or climbing up and down, depending on how suicidal he feels, the loader has no other functions. Also not very well equipped with anything much to do is the commander. He is seated to the left of the cannon, above the PRC-10 radio, and that's all he's got to play with. There's nothing more to be seen. Although delivery was supposed to start to the troops in 1957, there was a delay. Undergoing development at the same time was the SSM A23 Dart anti-tank missile. And it didn't seem to make very much sense to CONARC, the Continental Army Command, to be funding two different weapon systems, both designed to be mobile anti-tank systems. And because the M56 was really only designed for airborne use, it seemed more reasonable to CONARC that the money should go to the anti-tank missile instead. Well, the Chief of Ordnance and the Chief of R&D didn't like this, and in a situation somewhat reminiscent of World War II, they appealed for the vehicle to be put into production immediately anyway, because DART wasn't due to come into service for at least another two years. And everybody accepted that the M56 did the specifications that was laid out for it. However, the best they got was a study to determine whether or not the two systems could work together or one should be better than the other. Well, it turned out that the study said that they were complementary systems, not competitive ones. So the money started flowing. An order for 160 was placed with Cadillac at a driveway unit cost of $107,000. They were issued out on the basis of 30 vehicles for an airborne division. A subsequent order for 290 vehicles was placed in 1959. And as an example of how you can buy in bulk and reduce the cost, the price per vehicle of these was $43,333 and 99 cents. The vehicle did see combat service. 173rd Airborne Brigade took it to Vietnam and it stayed there until about 1970 when it was finally replaced by the M551 Sheridan. Doubtless the low ground pressure and high mobility was useful, 
but the complete lack of any form of protection whatsoever probably didn't endear it to people, given the environment. The vehicle did go on to see further service with the militaries of Morocco, Spain, and South Korea. That's it for the M56 Scorpion. We'll see you on the next one. Capable of traversing soft and marshy mud, terrain, stuff, other things that it might happen to run across, badgers, or cargo airport, airport? I'm reading a bloody thing and I can't get it right. To be transported in a heavy assault glider or cargo aircraft. Good. Gonna pull the trigger. If it works, fantastic. <laughs> We are back at Tankland, and Red Legs rejoice for in front of a 155mm gun motor carriage M53. A overhead protective roof to keep the sun off while you have your barbecue and bar. Well, the rear of the vehicle seems nice and spacious. I'm actually standing pretty much at full height. Until you realize that there's actually six people in this turret, so things start getting a little bit more cramped and probably annoying. 